if you encounter Jesus Christ, you encounter fully God. If you encounter the Father, you encounter fully God. If you encounter the Spirit, you encounter fully God. Each of them are fully divine. The, the, the leaves on a clover as well, you, you encounter one leaf, you haven't encountered the whole thing. So as Jesus says famously, doesn't he, in John's Gospel, if you have met me, you have met the Father. Jesus doesn't say, if you've met me, you've met a third of the Trinity, and well done for meeting that third, you now need to see the other two thirds. No, he says, if you have met me, you have met the Father. I'm fully divine. I'm going to start by reading to you Romans chapter 8. So Romans 8 is one of the most famous and well-loved chapters in the Bible. Um, and it's really, really good for us to be familiar with it. So maybe you are already, maybe you're not. It's page 1134, if you've got a church Bible. So let me, let me read to you uh, all of Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. We do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all, but who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, 
God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then should we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. What a great, great chapter. There are so many lines in there that you just want to hold on to, aren't there? Um, some of them are, are super famous, like verse 28. You know that all things God works for the good of those who love him. What about the fact that he will graciously give us all things along with his son? What about that? Great. Let me pray for us as we come to consider this amazingly big topic in one short evening. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we come to think about you and your son, the Lord Jesus, and the Spirit, we pray that you might help us to think right thoughts about who you are and what you're like. Uh, it's even sort of dangerous territory that we're treading on tonight, trying to understand things which we will never fully grasp. So we pray that you'd give us the, a right humility and an eagerness to think clearly, but also a right sort of timidity as we tread carefully on these great truths that we might um, be concerned to worship you properly and truly. So bless us, we ask, and help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Basically, your, your handout is all the cross-references that I am giving this evening. So this, this piece of paper will save you a lot of thumbing in the Bible and hopefully will mean that we can move reasonably quickly. We've been looking at these uh, foundational doctrines on these Sunday evenings. So these are truths from across the Bible that are important for us, essential for us to have a, a handle on as we uh, think through what it means to be a Christian. So this isn't everything that you need to know about the Trinity. It's maybe not even everything you would like to know about the Trinity, but it's at least stuff that you should know about the Trinity. Uh, so if you've not heard of the Trinity before, this is the Bible's message that the one God of the Bible is in three persons. And what I want to do, maybe understandably, maybe just obviously, is to make three statements about the Trinity and then just to think through about how those might apply to our lives. So the three statements first. The first statement is this, there is one God. There is one God. This is really, really important that we get this straight in our mind. The doctrine of the Trinity is not that there are three separate gods, but rather that there is only one God. The Bible is super clear on this from the very beginning to the very end. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is the Jewish Shema. Recited by Jewish children as they're taught about God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One God. Isaiah 45 says the same thing. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know that there is none beside me. 
I am the Lord and there is no other, he says. Now, all of that is significant because it means, doesn't it, that when the apostles in the New Testament start worshipping Jesus as being divine, these are guys who have been trained in the Jewish way, in the, in the Shema. They know that there is only one God. They understood that there was only one God. So this gets affirmed by the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Again, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. James writes the same thing in James 2 when he says, you believe that there is one God, he says. Good. In other words, that's right. There is only one God. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So there is only one God, and that's true from the beginning to the end of the Bible. And as the apostles introduce the idea of the divinity of the Lord Jesus, they are not contradicting the oneness of God. Our theologians down the years have talked about God being of one essence. So God is not divided into parts, nor are there three gods. Rather, there is one divine essence, which is shared by the three persons who make one God. Three par persons partaking in the divine essence is how it's put. Now, in a way, that's the simplest and easiest of the three statements we're going to make, but it is an important one to start with. There is one God. God is one. Okay, so that's logged. That's in place. Next statement, God is three persons. Here we want to make the point that while there is one God, there are three distinct, identifiable, talkaboutable, is that a word? No, persons in the one God. So it's possible to talk about the Son and say stuff about the Son whilst not talking about the Father or the Spirit. So we can say that the Son took on human flesh. The Father did not take on human flesh, neither did the Spirit. The Spirit was sent at Pentecost to the disciples. The Son was not sent, nor was the Father, even though the Spirit is one God with the Father and with the Son. We can say that the Son obeyed the plan of the Father, not his own plan or the plan of the Spirit, but the plan of the Father, even though they are only one God. You might put it this way, although they all share the divine essence and the same divine characteristics, still, the Father is not the Son or the Spirit, and the Son is not the Spirit or the Father. Now, that means it's not right, is it, to think that this is one God turning up in three different ways at different times. You know, people teach that, don't they? I don't know whether you've heard the illustration of uh, the Trinity's like water, steam, and ice. Yeah, have you heard that? That's not right, is it? Because water, steam, and ice can't all exist at the same time in the same place, can they? That's just one thing, water turning up in different forms. But God is not like that. Uh, the three persons all exist, even though there's only one God. Now, there are lots of different places you could go to to prove that, because it's the assumption of the Bible. In fact, I think unless you get this, the Bible will just sound weird to you as it talks about who God is and what he's like. But let's begin in Ephesians, because hopefully that's becoming a bit more familiar to us, um, and go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 17. This is what Paul writes. I keep asking that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Do you see those, the three persons of the Trinity all talked about independently in the same verse? I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Three persons distinct, yet not separated from one another. Now, let's just be careful here not to neglect the Spirit. I, I think we need to be careful to remember that the Spirit is a person of the Trinity in his own right. The Spirit is not a force of the Father and the Son. So there are lots of places, again, that you can um, go to prove that. It's there, isn't it, in Ephesians 1.17 that we are uh, told independently that the Lord might give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. But it's also uh, 
The Spirit intercedes for us in Romans 8, which we read earlier as well. And in John 14, the Son promises to send the Spirit. And listen to how it's put. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And so here's the, the Spirit is an independent person of the Trinity, talked about uh, in relation to his work with the Father and with the Son. Wayne Greedham, in his book, Systematic Theology, points out helpfully that if you think that the Holy Spirit is just the power of God, then lots of the verses of the Bible don't make any sense. So Acts chapter 10 is one of the examples he gives, which is quite, uh, it's quite clever, really. Um, here we read in Acts 10, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. So this is Peter preaching, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Now, look, look back at the verse and read it as if the Holy Spirit is just a force or a power. Then the Holy Spirit would be, well, Jesus would be anointed with power and power. It would make literally no sense, would it? Uh, Jesus is uh, uh, anointed with the person of the Spirit in his human flesh, given the Spirit and power, not power, power. Maybe the most significant uh, implication of this is in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Do you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira? So people have been uh, giving money for the work of the gospel and laying it at the apostles' feet. And someone, uh, Barnabas, think, did it, didn't he? He sold uh, some property and he laid all the money at the apostles' feet. And now Ananias and Sapphira come to sort of do the same kind of thing, but they're pretending that they're giving all the money when really they're holding back some for themselves. And it wasn't that it was wrong for them only to give part of the money. The thing that was wrong is that they were lying. They were trying to pretend that they were being more spiritual than they really were. And Peter said this, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept yourself some of the money you received for the land? Did it not belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Notice that, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is a person. You can't lie to a power or a force. You lie to a person. And you lie to the person of the Spirit, who is, at the end of that little section, God. The divinity of the Spirit, the person of the Spirit. So here's the second pillar of the doctrine of the Trinity. There are three persons. Father, Son, and Spirit. One God, three persons. Father, Son, and Spirit. The final thing then to say, before we think about the implications of this, is that the three persons are all fully divine. It's a mistake to think that any of the three persons are less than fully divine. The divine essence is not divided up into three so that each of them is only a third God and you need to get all three of them together in order to get the full God. Actually, they are all fully divine. This is where the, the three-leaf clover illustration breaks down. You, know, you heard that one? Or the three parts of an egg? The shell, the white, and the yolk? It's all right. Because the shell is not the whole egg. The white is not the whole egg. The yolk is not the whole egg. But if you encounter Jesus Christ, you encounter fully God. You encounter the Father, you encounter fully God. If you encounter the Spirit, you encounter fully God. Each of them are fully divine. The, the, the leaves on a clover as well, you, you encounter one leaf, you haven't encountered the whole thing. So as Jesus says famously, doesn't he, in John's Gospel, if you have met me, you have met the Father. Jesus doesn't say, if you've met me, you've met a third of the Trinity, and well done for meeting that third, you now need to see the other two thirds. No, he says, if you have met me, you have met the Father. I'm fully divine. Now, we thought, didn't we, a bit about the Holy Spirit in the last section. Think with me now about the Son. Let's think about this fact that God the Son is fully divine. Where would you go to prove that? Well, John chapter 1 assumes it, doesn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Here, not only does John assume the divinity of the Lord Jesus, but he talks about 
divine work belonging to the Son, divine work from eternity past, the beginning, he says. In the beginning, he was with God. It's amazing, isn't it? John is echoing Genesis 1 type language, but talking about the Son, who is the, the one he's met. In verse 18 of the same chapter, he spells it out in even greater detail, doesn't he? No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. The verdict is affirmed by Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas at the end of chapter 20, where he meets the risen Lord Jesus and he calls him what? Anyone know? My Lord and my God, yeah. An incredible thing to say about someone that you've spent three years following, yeah? I don't doubt that the better you know me, the less likely you are to think I'm divine, <laughs> yeah? The better you know me, the less likely you are to worship me. The clearer my faults will become to you. With Jesus, it is the opposite. The better the disciples got to know him, the more inclined they were to worship him. My Lord and my God, he says. Now that leads us to a really important distinction made in John 3.16, where we learn that the Son was not made by the Father, nor really created by him, but begotten by him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, is the way that our NIV translates it. But the, the Greek word there, which is monogenous, carries this sort of significance of being generated by the Father without being a creature, eternally generated by the Father. We're going to think more about that uh, in a, a week or so's time as we think about the person of Christ. But perhaps the clearest indication of the divinity of the Son is the fact that he does the work of the divine. So he raises the dead, he heals the sick, he calms the storm. Think about this with me, because I think this really helped me, especially when trying to explain the gospel to other people. Thinking about, well, does Jesus actually just kind of sit down and say, listen, I'm God. You need to listen to me, I'm God. Well, he does actually really directly claim divinity on a number of occasions, but actually you can see it really clearly in his works. Psalm 107 is a really great example. Psalm 107 says this, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm and he guided them to their desired haven. That's Psalm 107 verse 28 to 30. Now then, if you jump forward to Mark chapter 4, this is the occasion of Jesus calming the storm. That day, when evening came, he said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher don't you care if we drown he got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves quiet be still then the wind died down and it was completely calm and his disciples said to him sorry he said to his disciples why are you so afraid you still have no no faith they were terrified and asked each other who is this even the wind and the waves obey him you know, who is this it's okay right this is a sunday school lesson who is this psalm 107 who is the one who calms the wind and the sea? God. God calms the wind and the sea. Psalm 107. Who is this in the boat with us who now stands and commands the waves quiet and be still? Oh, this person who got in the boat just as he was, who's sleeping, is divine. Incredible, isn't it? Stunning. Now, it's worth saying here, isn't it? This means that the Unitarians are wrong to say that Jesus is less than divine, and so are the Jehovah Witnesses. And I want to say this, that they are more than just a little bit wrong, right? It's, it's not that they are worshipping the same God, but have this small technicality about the Trinity wrong. It's not that, is it? They're worshipping a different God, because central to who God is, is that he's Father, Son, and Spirit, each person is fully divine. And that's how Christianity has been defined and understood for the, the whole of its history. And so to step outside of that is not to make a small error, but it is to cease to be Christian at all. So here we have it, one God, three persons, 
each fully divine, which means we have one God accomplishing one plan of salvation, working together in three persons. Theologians have called that the economic trinity. I quite like that word. The economic trinity doesn't have anything to do with the economy. It just means that each person is working distinctly for the one plan, economically working together for the accomplishment of one plan. The Father is not the Son, nor the Spirit, but is the Father. But they work together. They are each fully divine. They are accomplishing one great plan of salvation together. Now, let me say a few things by way of application. First one is this. If you understand it, you don't get it, right? Those three statements, I think, can make it sound as if the doctrine of the Trinity is really super simple and easy to get your head around. But once you really start to think about it, your brain begins to hurt. And in fact, if it doesn't, you're probably wrong. Because if you've reduced God to something so simple that you can understand him fully, or you think you're understanding him fully, then you must have gone significantly wrong. There is huge mystery here, isn't there? How can it be that the Father and the Son are one, that the Son indwells the Father and the Father indwells the Son, and that the Spirit indwells them both? Yet the Son can say that according to his human nature, he doesn't know the time of his return. How does that work? I don't know. What is the divine essence? What does it mean to have a share in the divine essence without reducing the divine essence? I don't know. When we say that God in eternity was triune, what does it look like for God in eternity to be triune? How do these persons relate to one another eternally? I don't really know. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong, does it? In fact, I think it's more likely to mean that it is right. We can no more fit God into our minds and understand him than my dog can read a newspaper, to use that old illustration. And that's a good thing, right? It's good for us spiritually to understand that whilst we can make true statements about who God is, we cannot reduce him to someone that we can fully grasp. So I, I think we get confused about this, don't we? Because we think unless we can know everything, we can't know anything truly. But as the Bible teaches us the doctrine of God, it teaches us that we can know true things about God without us knowing everything about him. And that's where we sit, isn't it, humbly as Christians. I know true things about God, even though I don't know everything about him, because I couldn't know everything about him, because I am finite and he is infinite. Okay. Second implication, it is possible for God to be love. This is mind-blowing, isn't it? But without the doctrine of the Trinity, without God being eternally three persons, he cannot be love. So 1 John 4 verse 8 famously says that God is love. It doesn't say that God is loving, nor does it say that God loves. Rather, it says that fundamental to who God is, is that God is love. But of course, a, 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 a mono God, yeah, a single one God without the Trinity cannot be love. Allah cannot be love. Why? Well, because in eternity, before creation, he has no one to love. He cannot express something like love because he is just alone. Only the triune God can be love in that way because the three persons of the Trinity have been loving one another from eternity past. Which is brilliant because it means that my experience of the love of God does not have to be founded on my loveliness, drawing out something about God that wouldn't otherwise exist without me being lovely, right? But rather, this is God eternally spilling over who he already is in himself as I experience his love. So God's love is very different to his wrath. God's wrath is the response of his goodness and his justice to the presence of sin which hasn't been there eternally, has it? Without sin, there is no wrath, but in eternity past, God was loving. That's fantastic, isn't it? That's absolutely fantastic. That brings us uh, to another point, which I think we've seen a few times in these last few weeks, but that's, this is this, thirdly, God does not need the world he has made. He doesn't need the world. He doesn't, 
He's independent and sufficient without the world that he's created. He didn't make the world because he's lonely. He didn't make the world because he, he wanted companions. In fact, it's probably better to think of this the other way around. I, we make things, don't we, because we need them, yeah? You make dinner because you're hungry, right? And so you want, there's something lacking in you, so you make something in order to fill a need in yourself. You make a car so that you can get around more quickly. Although in London, I think you probably get around more slowly. Anyway, you get a, maybe you make a bicycle so you can get around more quickly. You get an education so that you can learn stuff. There is a deficiency in your understanding, so you get an education in order to fill your brains in. But God doesn't make like that. God doesn't make to make up for something he's missing. Rather, God makes more really as an overspill of who he is. Making is not essential to God in that sense, but it's, it's almost inevitable as, as an overspill of him, of his divine fullness. He makes creatures to love, not because he's not able to love without the creatures that he's made, but because he is so loving that he spills out into making people to love. He's not lonely. He's so full that it spills over into creation, like a, like a, a cup that's under a tap that's just running and running and running and running and running. And that's not to make us feel insignificant or pointless, is it? Oh, God didn't need to make me. I'm kind of just useless. It's not that at all. Actually, it's to make us feel really secure. My existence and my experience of God's love is rooted in his character and his goodness. I depend on him every day for everything. And he is all sufficient. So it means that we are invited into the relationship where we are given to, not taken from. Isn't that incredible? I'm invited into a relationship with God where I am given to, not taken from. It is not a deficiency in God that means he invites me into a relationship with him. It is that I am not able to exist outside of knowing him, and so he invites me to know him. You don't have a relationship like that anywhere else, do you? Finally, and then I'll take some questions and comments. Distinct but inseparable will be fingerprinted all over the world. These are not natty headings, are they? I'm sorry. The final thing to say is this. If this is what God is like, if God is triune, three distinct, different, but inseparable persons, then I should expect that fact to be reflected across the world that he's made. But the most beautiful things in our world will be this union of distinct persons full of difference, but held together. And I think probably the place that we see it clearest, the only real illustration of the Trinity is in the marriage of a man to a woman who are distinct from one another, who are different to one another, but in marriage are inseparable from one another. Now that's to be expected, isn't it, from the way that God has made the world, the fingerprints of the triune God. It's the same in the church, isn't it? Consider what we were thinking about this morning, that in church life, Christ smashes the dividing walls of hostility between us and unites cultures and backgrounds together in local churches as a reflection of the God who made us in whose image we're made. Diversity and difference with unity and purpose is a reflection, isn't it, of Father, Son, and Spirit. Let me say again, just as a bit of an aside, really, but this is why the definition of marriage is so important in theology. In marriage, in the Bible, it's a man and a woman made in the image of God together who are united in a covenant relationship, which is a reflection of the difference and yet unity of the God who made us. So the marriage of a man to a man or a woman to a woman cannot reflect God in that way because there's no difference in the unity. Does that make sense? And so that's why the definition of marriage in the Bible is the unity of a woman to a man in the difference and yet unity together. So there's just uh, four very brief implications of the doctrine of the Trinity. One is that you can't know it completely and fully. It's possible for God to be love. He does not need us or the world that he has made and distinct but inseparable are fingerprinted all over the world.